Leah Austin wrote me a note after Rosh Hashanah and said that my friend and colleague, Rabbi Adam Kligfeld, had quoted me extensively at Temple Beth Am in Los Angeles in his remarks about the silence of the shofar. I'm sure you know that rabbis talk with each other. We exchange ideas about what worked, what didn't work at the high holidays. I talked with another colleague, not Rabbi Kligfeld, who told me that last year at this moment, the beginning of Yom Kippur, he decided he was going to be very blunt and shock people. And so he turned to his congregation and he said, today is Yom Kippur and we need to realize that every person in this congregation is going to die. <laughs> A hush came over the crowd and everyone was very serious, except there was one guy in the third row who was smiling. And he didn't want to publicly embarrass the guy, but he was really bothered by the guy's smile. And so he walked over and he asked him slowly, he said, why are you smiling right now? And the man said, I'm not from this congregation. I'm just here on business. <laughs> Whether or not <laughs> we are just in town for business, Yom Kippur is a day for us to think about our mortality. It's a day when we think about, even rehearse our own deaths. It's a day on which we refrain from sexual relations, from bathing, from wearing leather shoes, from eating, and from drinking. I want to take a moment and say something about fasting, about not eating and drinking on Yom Kippur, and that is that we should fast only if we are able to fast. The rabbis say, if we feel that we should eat, then the rabbis say we should go ahead and eat. We are trusted to make that decision for ourselves. And if a person says that they don't need to eat, but there are doctors who say this person should eat, then the rabbis say, ignore what the person says about themselves, and the person should eat. There is a current in the Jewish tradition, in the rabbinic tradition, towards being lenient and making sure that we don't endanger ourselves. I want to read you a beautiful meditation that was making the rounds this year for someone who cannot fast on Yom Kippur. On this day of atonement, this Sabbath of Sabbaths, this year and every year, it is so central to join the people of Israel in denying ourselves food and drink for one day so that we can focus on, our, on correcting our misdeeds, on knowing our mortality, on reaching for a life of Torah and mitzvot and loving kindness on you, O God. You know, dear God, that it is not my intent to be apart from our people and our tradition. My current state of health makes it unsuitable for me to fast. So, dear God, I turn to you now in sincerity and openness. Help me in the coming year to do my best in guarding my health. Help us, your children, to learn how to protect our bodies from harm. May my eating be as a fast, may it be dedicated to you, to tshuva, to renewal, to the restoration of my relationship with you and others and myself. All I can say is amen. The rabbis even have a word for someone who should not fast, but they decide that they're going to try and fast any word. Anyways, they call that person a chassid shoteh, which literally means a stupid, pious person. <laughs> so don't be a stupid, pious person. It's a strange thing to emphasize at the beginning of a 25-hour fast, but fasting isn't the essence of today. Repentance is the essence. 
it's a tool, fasting is, so that we emerge from Yom Kippur more dedicated to doing acts of justice and righteousness. And I'll say, because Evelina wants me to, and because we should, give to the High Holiday Food Drive. We should help other people to have something to eat. I also want to begin with an apology um, on Rosh Hashanah, even just right then, I typically, and on Shabbat also, I typically say, please rise. And what I should say, and what I mean, and I hope you know that I mean it, is please rise if you're able. Um, high holidays is a time when we describe God as le'ela, le'ela, minkol birchata v'shirata, which means above and beyond any words which we use to describe God. And it's the same thing. If we sit or we stand or we bow, these are not things that God needs. These are things that we do to try to help us to focus and connect. And we can have full confidence. I don't have a red line to God, but here I know. I say this with full confidence that God will be very grateful for our prayers if they are offered, seated, or stated. And finally, I want to say a word about regret. Today is a day on which we think about our lives, about our mistakes, about regret for things that we did that we wish we hadn't done and things that we didn't do that we wish we had. There is a debate in Jewish law, as you can imagine, about whether we atone on Yom Kippur for sins just from the year which has passed, or whether on Yom Kippur we're supposed to focus on sins that we've committed our entire lives. And the idea of focusing on our whole lives, again, may seem in some ways cruel or even at cross purposes with the themes of the today. If we were forgiven on previous Yom, Yom Kippurs, why would the rabbi say we have to come back? My teacher and friend, Rabbi David Wolpe, explains that to understand this, it's helpful to think back to the biggest moment of regret for the Jewish people, the sin of the golden calf. You know the story, Moses is up on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. He's getting the Torah. He's getting tablets that were written with the finger of the God. He, with the finger of God, he's slightly delayed down below. And lo and behold, the people decide to make a golden calf. And he says, you better go. By the way, this is really fun. He says, Moses, go down to the people that you brought out of Egypt. <laughs> I don't want them anymore. And he comes down the mountain, and he's angry, and he smashes the tablets. And Rabbi Wolpe describes this scene as a carnival of regret. God regrets ever choosing the Jewish people, and he wants to start over with the new people. And I imagine that Moses, for a moment, looks at the tablets written with the finger of God and feels a sense of regret. Oh my gosh, what have I done? And maybe he's looking at Aaron, his brother, and saying, why did I choose to leave you in charge? And the people eventually regret their sin but to heal, does Moses and the people, did they just say, okay, it's all done, let's not talk about it again? No. Does God say, okay, we're just going to go back to the way everything was before? No. According to the rabbis, luchot v'shivrei luchot, munachot ba'aron, which means the tablets and the shattered tablets are both in the ark. Bethel is full of a lot of amazing people, many of whom have published books. This year, longtime Bethel member Orit Ramler published a wonderful book called The Box of Life, a guide to living with purpose and preserving what matters most. I don't get a cut, by the way. But in the book, she encourages us to each create a box of memories, to curate the meaning of our lives by preserving memories that we hold dear. Or reads 
book is a treasure that I commend to you, but whether or not we've created such a box of memories, I'd like to suggest that what the rabbis had in mind when they said that the Shivrei Luchot are in the Ark is that we should have a box of our regrets. And it's that box that we take out and we look at on Yom Kippur, not to beat ourselves up, not to diminish ourselves, but because, as Bishop Godby put it so eloquently from this bima yesterday, when we have a regret, it's not just a wound, it's an instruction. Do you remember when you yelled at someone you loved? Do you remember the look of hurt on their faces when you said words in anger that you knew would cut them and hurt them? We carry the broken tablets of our lives with us through the desert because every regretted moment is not something just to be cast aside and forgotten. It's a precious shard to be taken out of our box of memories today, handled carefully, looked at, examined, remembered, and God willing, used to refine our souls and to make us better for the years to come. That is the work of today. Now we will begin.